All right, so what I want to talk to you about is building modern applications for the cloud and thinking beyond just serverless and thinking about containers as well and how you might use both in an application. I first became excited about serverless a couple of years ago when I worked at Microsoft on Azure Functions. And I was on the product from when it was in private preview to public preview to a year after general availability. And in that time, I saw the shift of serverless computing and the changes that it's making to application architectures. It's really empowering people to move the, to the cloud more quickly than before and with a lot less overhead than before. And I have to say, for a while, I was skeptical about containers because on Azure, a platform as a service is very popular and you can do a lot of what you would do with containers using Azure App Service. But now that I've worked at Pulumi and I've been helping customers move onto the cloud and using other platforms like AWS, I see that there's really a need to use both of these in one application. The problem is the conversation around serverless and containers, I think, really leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, this is a cartoon by Forrest Brazil who has this excellent comic, Faz and Furious. I highly recommend it. Um, and the caption is, the two tribes regarded each other suspiciously in the glow of their brightly blazing production environments. And he's pointing out a real trend. It's almost like there's a rift between these two communities. Like, they can't talk to each other. You know, people discover containers and they're like, oh my God, this is the most awesome thing ever. Dockerize everything and it will solve all your problems. And at the same time, people discover serverless. They discover all the benefits of event-based programming where you don't have to manage your infrastructure. And they're like, oh my God, this is awesome. Make everything serverless and it'll solve all your problems. And of course, the reality is not quite that simple. And there's a whole track today talking about how to make serverless work in production. And there's conferences devoted to making containers work in production. But what I find interesting is that at most conferences, there aren't talks that talk about both serverless and containers. In fact, usually there's a separate track for containers and then there's another track for serverless. And it's almost creating this problem that we're talking about here. And the thing that's, that's silly is that it doesn't need to be this way. We don't need one solution to solve everything. It's not a popularity contest. The, the, a customer is not going to choose your service or your application because you're using the hot new technology. They care about whether or not you're solving problems for them. So you need to think about how can you use technology to solve your business problems. And so I think we should, we should revise this cartoon and add some unicorns and rainbows and create this happy bridge between containers and serverless. And stop talking about one versus the other, but talk about serverless and containers. Where does each shine? Where do they fit into a modern application? So could I get a show of hands of how many of you are using containers in production? So about a third of the audience. And how many of you are using serverless in production? Uh, so less than that, which makes sense because serverless is a new trend. So what I want to talk to you about is how to think about these two technologies as you move to your cloud journey. Because it's not about finding the answer that everyone's talking about. It's about what your team knows well and what your, your skill set is and what works best for your business. At a high level, I like to think about, about this as a trade-off between control and productivity and abstraction. So with containers, you get full control over your compute workload. And sometimes you need full control, and that's great. That's why containers are so popular and so powerful. On the other hand, sometimes you don't need this level of control. And that's where serverless comes in. It scales instantly, and it tends to be much easier to own and operate. And modern applications need both of these compute models. In fact, if you talk to everyone uh, who's a speaker in the serverless track today, they'll tell you serverless is not the best fit for every application. And it's unlikely that your entire application will be serverless. And so that's why we should reach for other things like containers because the, the, the problem we're trying to solve is our business problem, not using some hot new technology. 
So the way I like to think about these two models is to kind of go back and think about programming. And in the very early days, you had assembly, and that's it, which gave you a lot of control over the machine. You know, you're programming registers, you have low-level instructions, and you can make everything super performant. But there is no abstraction. So if you wanted a reusable function, you know, you're copying and pasting. It's not a productive experience. And so that's why people got so excited with C and C++, because it dramatically improved upon that, and it raised the level of abstraction. And now, of course, we're using lots and lots of high-level languages, and it's rare to write code in assembly. But of course, we sometimes mix and match. You know, it's very common when you're using JavaScript to use a native module, same with Python. So we find the tool that best suits the problem we're trying to solve. And I think the same thing is true when it comes to cloud services. And I think the quote by Isaac Newton is very relevant here, and I think this is really the heart of abstraction. He said, if I've seen further, it is only by standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think the modern day equivalent of that is, I solved this problem in a day because I found a package on NPM. <laughs> and, but this is what computing is all about. We're solving problems more quickly than generations before us because we have more abstractions available to us. So let's think about cloud services in kind of two dimensions, control and abstraction. And there tends to be a trade-off of one versus the other. So if you think of virtual machines, they give you a lot of control. You can do whatever you want to this machine, but not a lot of abstraction. The abstraction is only that the hardware is abstracted from you, not the software. So that's why containers are so popular, because they give you more abstraction while still maintaining a high degree of control. And there's new services, like serverless containers. Now, I, I will say that some people disagree with calling these kind of container services serverless, things like Azure Container Instances and AWS Fargate, because serverless folks really need things, things to debate amongst themselves. But these are services where you don't pre-provision the compute. You just provide a Docker image, you give it to the platform, and it runs it for you. And of course, there's platform as a service, things like Heroku, Azure App Service, Google App Engine, which give a different point in the dimension between abstraction and control, where you probably need a front end if you're building a web app, so they give you a front end. If you want HTTPS, you just click a button and upload a cert. So it's providing you a lot more abstraction compared to the raw compute, even compared to containers. And serverless is not, in this, in this case, it's not really a completely new thing. It's just a different point on this spectrum where you get more abstraction and you give up control. And giving up control often means there's less for you to manage and less to be responsible for, which is why there's so many benefits to serverless. So let's talk about the, the first model we had for computing, which was virtual machines. So we can talk about how things have progressed compared to that. So the thing that I always say is virtual machines were really great for the ops department of a business because they stopped having to physically buy servers. But the experience for developers is largely the same. The only difference is you get a server in 30 seconds as opposed to six months of filling out a procurement and getting networking and everything set up. But as an application developer, the way you get your code onto that machine and the way you scale it is nearly identical to how it worked when you were developing on-premise. So you have to think about things like patching the server and how you're gonna patch the server. How are you gonna get your code onto that VM? And of course there's decisions to make. Are you gonna make a machine image that has your code built in? Or do you have some process running on the machine that updates your application? And how many servers do I need? How do I scale my app? These are all things that you have to think about and decide and write code for because there's nothing built in that solves these problems for you. So that's why containers are so powerful. They reduce complexity. Instead of talking about a machine, you talk about your application. You have a Docker file that you turn into a Docker image. Instead of manually scaling VMs, you have a container orchestrator where you tell it how many instances you need to have running and how they interact with one another. So this raises the level of abstraction 
making you more productive. And this is why people are so excited about containers. If you think about this slide compared to the previous one, the benefits are really clear. So with containers, you author a Docker file and you specify your exact environment you want to run in. What operating system are you using? What version of that operating system? What dependencies do you have? What software are you going to run on? And then you specify your application. And you have full control over the environment you're running in. So you have the amount of control that you have with a virtual machine, but you have this nice declarative format rather than some imperative process that's producing an image or modifying a VM in place. And then you build this and put this in a container registry. This is how you actually get it into production. And then you use a container orchestrator, such as uh, AWS has the Elastic Container Service. And you create something called a task definition, which then points to that image. And that's how you get it running in production. But notice here, you're not talking about machines. You're talking about something higher level. And that's why people are so excited about containers, especially for existing workloads. Containers are a great solution. You have this useful package format. You're not talking about VMs. You're talking about your application. You still get full control over your application environment, what exact version of Linux you want, what packages are installed. You get to decide how your tasks are placed and how things are staled out. And you get to choose your compute. You get to choose the actual machines that you're going to run on, how much hardware and software, uh, what this hardware and software is for them. Now, with great power comes great responsibility. So, uh, for instance, if you're using ECS, you author a task definition and a service description, which at runtime turns into a number of running instances. And you have to think about what this diagram in the right needs to look like for your environment. So there's more to manage. And at the top here, notice there's a cluster. So that means there's physical machines that you have to provision. So you need to decide how big the machines are and how, how you're going to irrit tasks on there. If you have a lot of compute, you want to think about density and making sure you're using this compute efficiently. You need to think about scaling this. If you're getting a lot of traffic on Black Friday, Containers often won't scale fast enough for you to, to scale on demand. So you need to pre-provision capacity. So there's a lot to manage. And this is part of the fight between serverless and containers. Because serverless folks say, I don't really need to manage all this stuff for my problem. And sometimes you don't need to manage it. So uh, think about this. When, you're, when you own the Docker file, that means you own the Docker file, which means if there is a problem with one of your dependencies, like a security vulnerability, it's up to you to manage that. You also need to think about building your container images. One thing I find really interesting about Docker is that you actually need cloud infrastructure just to deploy your app because you need a container registry instance. So there's this very interesting dynamic between the build time of your application and the runtime. It kind of gets mixed together. So there's more to manage here. And then you need to talk about how you're going to get your containers into production. And that's why there are whole talks on the best way to get your containers into production, because there are a lot of options here. And you still need to think about your physical hardware, how many servers you need, and how you're going to scale it. But when you have a container orchestrator, it's a lot easier, because there's built-in primitives that talk about scaling out your containers. So this is why serverless is a more abstract way of doing computing, and there's less to manage. With serverless, you just provide your code. You trigger off of some set of events. It could be a timer. You run around a function every five minutes. It could be an HTTP request. It could be a file that's added to uh, blob storage. It could be a queue message. And the only thing that you give your cloud provider is what you want to be triggered on and what code needs to run when you're triggered. That's it. So there's no managing dependencies. There's no talk about servers. That's it. You give only that to your cloud platform. In fact, you can't even say how many servers you want, even if you wanted to say that. And the cloud platform decides how to scale you out based on the rate of incoming events. So you can see we're moving forward into more and more abstraction. With containers, that was an abstraction over VMs. With serverless, that's more abstraction compared to containers. Instead of talking about your dependencies, you talk about your code. And there are a lot of benefits and a lot of platforms to choose from, such as Lambda, 
Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, and others, and you get event-driven compute with near instant scale. So you don't need to pre-provision capacity. If you're going to get a lot of traffic on Black Friday, your platform will scale you out. Of course, you need to do some architectural work to make sure it scales correctly, but you don't need to think about servers. The other thing is that the compute is completely managed and ephemeral. You can't SSH into the instance that's running your function. That doesn't even make sense, which means you have a lot less control over the platform and a lot less responsibility. Of course, you need to still know what's going on with your instances, which is why monitoring tools are very important. But it's a lot nicer of an experience to provide your code and have the vendor manage the platform rather than you manage it. The other thing is it frees you up from capacity planning because you don't have to pay for idle. So you can scale up and you can scale down to zero, which means that it's really easy to have developer environments that are replicated, like uh, Joe Emerson was talking about in the previous talk, where every single developer can use the cloud and it doesn't cost a lot extra. Now, I will point out, if you're thinking the term serverless is silly, I agree with you. There are, of course, servers, and I really hate when people choose that as the thing they want to pick on with serverless. Um, but of course, the term comes from the idea that servers aren't what you're thinking about. You're thinking about code and your application. So you have a higher level of abstraction. And serverless has a lot of benefits. You have less operational overhead because there's less to manage. And this gives you a faster time to market with the ability to focus on the business value that you're providing. You know, every single company out there needs to manage a cluster and provision servers and do that kind of thing. And that's not what makes you different from every company. What makes you different is the unique business value you're providing. Serverless lets you focus on what makes you different and what makes you unique and accelerates your time to market. So my favorite example of this is from when I worked on the Azure Functions team. And we were going to do a training for a customer. And about a month ahead of time, we sent them an agenda of topics we would cover. And they were like, cool, this is great. And then we got there, and they were like, we can throw away this agenda. In the last month, we have built a proof of concept, working against real data in our environment. And what we want to do now is for you to help us get this to production. And we helped them out for a few days. And then a month later, they had that solution working in production. Now, it wasn't their complete application. It was just one part of it. But that was a solution that would have taken them months to build previously, because there was so much more that you have to think about when you're not using serverless. Serverless frees you from having to think about problems that are not core. So where does serverless do well? Well, things like scheduled tasks. You have data in your database that has duplicate records. This is often the easiest way to get into serverless. You run something every 15 minutes, you get rid of your duplicate data, or maybe you have a CSV file that needs to be imported into a database. Uh, if probably like me, you're, you're kind of sad at the fact that in this day and age, we are dealing with CSV files, but that is life. And so uh, having these cron jobs that you don't need to worry about servers for is really, really helpful. Another great example is batch processing, background processing. So the Seattle Times does this. A uh, photographer takes a photo at full resolution. The photo is uploaded to an S3 bucket in AWS, which triggers a lambda that resizes this image for web, tablet, and mobile. And this is, seems like a very simple scenario, but the thing I want you to think about is the developers building this solution, they didn't have to think about how many photos are going to get uploaded in a day? What's going to happen if a photographer you know, uploads his whole camera roll? You know, what are we going to do? Because the platform handles that. And you know, they're probably on the, in the steady state getting a low volume of requests. So that means they're not paying for compute when they're not actually using it. And you might have, of course, more data in your stream. Say you, know, you want to know what people are saying about your company on Twitter. And so you want to analyze all these tweets. You might wire that up to a service like AWS Kinesis and run Lambda functions to analyze the sentiment, write that back to a database. So serverless works best for event-based workloads. Now, the caveats are because you're managing less, you also have control over less. So the cloud vendor has specific 
languages and runtimes that it supports. There's a specific OS that it has, and you know, there's you know, particular versions of Node.js, for example, or specific versions of Python. If you want a version that they don't support, you're not gonna have a great time. At the same time, the execution environment is completely uniform, and that's how they do this instant scale out. You can't control what hardware you're running on. The only thing you can do is set how much memory your functions are gonna use. So if you have something that's really uh, CPU intensive and you want some specific instance to run that, serverless is not gonna be a great option. And the other thing to think about is serverless is designed for short tasks. Most vendors have a timeout of about five or 10 minutes that your functions can run. So if your solution is something that requires hours of processing, serverless is probably not gonna fit well. And I think this slide, or the details in this slide, this is why container folks, I think, sometimes dismiss serverless. Because they're like, oh, it's not gonna solve all my problems. So why would I consider it? And I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think instead, you should think about where does this solution work? Because containers don't solve all your problems either, and they bring problems of their own. So just be aware of what this service is designed for, where it shines, and what problems, what aspects of your problem could take advantage of the benefits. So one way to think about it is, so serverless gives you this commoditized compute where everything is identical. In containers, you can control everything, which means you have to manage everything. So it's kind of like the difference between renting a bike and owning a bike. So there's all these bikes, uh, bike uh, riding companies like Lime Bike, where you just walk up, you grab a bike, it's there when you need it, and you pay only for the time that you're using it. And if your friends all need bikes, you don't have to plan in advance, you all walk up and you rent a bike and you're off on your way. But these bikes are identical. They're all green, they all have a basket on the front, and that's it. So let's say you're commuting to work every day and your commute involves a very steep hill. Like in Seattle, we have a lot of very steep hills. You need more gears. You need storage because you're taking this to work every day. You need more features. And now, since you're using this bike so frequently, it's worth it to pay that upfront cost and to pay for the maintenance and to store this bike when you're not using it. So that's like containers. If you need to customize your execution environment, if you have a lot of volume, if this becomes an important business problem, then it's worth taking on these extra operational challenges. But if you just need commute, compute that scales on demand and you don't want this overhead, serverless is a great idea. Now, the, advantages, the advantage here is that there are new container execution models that make it a lot easier where you don't have to choose one versus the other. Because if you think about a Docker image, there's nothing inherent that says that has to run on pre-provisioned compute. So there are these new models for container execution that people sometimes call serverless, like Azure Container Instances and AWS Fargate, where you essentially get containers on demand. You point to a Docker image, and the service spins up an instance for you, and there's no cluster to manage. So the price per hour is a bit higher than if you had provisioned the compute yourself but you get more flexibility, and that's the trade-off. That's kind of the whole theme of this talk. There's just a lot of trade-offs to consider. What, what matters to you? What problems do you need to solve? And what costs are you willing to incur? So, containers are great when you need control over your execution environment. You need control either in the software, or in the hardware, or if you have long-running compute. That's where containers shine. If you have event-based compute that scales on demand, or if part of your application is event-based, serverless is a great fit because there's less to manage and less to configure. So in general, the further you are on the right, the more productive your experience is going to be. So if you don't need that level of control that you have with virtual machines, containers are good. And if you don't need the level of control of containers, serverless is great. So what I want to talk about is some architectures where you might combine these two because this is very common to need both kinds of compute in one application. So I talked about image thumbnailing with the Seattle Times and that was a great fit for Lambda. Now suppose instead we have a video and we want to show a particular frame of that video uh, like, you know, like every single video site does. Like in YouTube it shows you one particular frame. 
So someone's uploading a video, and we need to decide what frame to show. This is a really interesting problem, and it's different from the image one, because video data can be very, very large. And so it could take more than five minutes to process it, which means we might run out of time on Lambda. The other thing is one of the most popular tools for analyzing videos is FFmpeg, which is a library that has particular complex runtime requirements. There are particular libraries that you have to have installed on the machine in order for FFmpeg to work. And that's very difficult to get running in Lambda. Technically, it's possible, but you end up doing a lot of extra work because you're kind of shoehorning your problem into the compute that they provide. But if you take these two things together, you need to run more than five minutes. You need to customize your execution environment. This is a perfect solution, a per perfect problem for a service like Fargate, combined with Lambda. So when a video is uploaded to an S3 bucket, we'll invoke, that'll invoke a Lambda. This Lambda launches a task in Fargate that actually extracts the video thumbnail, which then writes out a JPEG. And that JPEG triggers a new Lambda, which will probably update a database saying that the video is now processed and ready. So let's talk about an example where you need even more compute than this, like ray tracing. You have a scene that you want to produce a ray traced image from. So maybe you'll upload this to an S3 bucket, which will trigger a lambda that will determine the work that needs to be done, which then puts a new message into a queue. And if we're doing a lot of ray tracing, we probably, we might have a situation where we need a lot of compute just right, right, laying around because this is a very compute intensive task. And we'll have a cluster that's just taking these requests and processing them, which will give us uh, you know, better, uh, better price per hour of compute uh, because we're using this compute basically at capacity. So the, the cluster, the job that's running in the cluster will listen on these queue messages and decide what it needs to do, and it will then write out to uh, another bucket. So you can combine these two things very nicely, and you don't have to decide that you're gonna only use containers, even if you need the long-running compute like in ray tracing. So let's talk about another example with a web front end. So let's say that you have, uh, you, you're an e-commerce site, and you're allowing customers to provide reviews as well as images of the product. Now, because this is the internet and you can't trust anybody, there is no e-commerce site that's in its right mind that would just take that image and just put it on the website, right? You need to moderate it. So you could use human moderation or you could use machine learning. So since it's a website, we have a database. Um, so when the image is uploaded, it'll save the review it will save the image, but it will mark it. It has not yet reviewed. And it will save file to storage. And it creates a new queue message that says this image needs to be moderated. And you have an Azure function, for example, that triggers off of that queue message and kicks off a machine learning process using a managed machine learning service like the ones in Azure. And depending on the result of the, whether or not it passed or failed, it writes back to the database. So even though this website is not a good fit for serverless because it's uh, long running, it's using a specific framework, it's an existing application, so we're running it in a PaaS, you could also run it in a container, you can still integrate that with a serverless function. There are always little things that are going on on a web backend that could use event-based processing. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is chaining functions together. Now, Joe Emerson, in his talk about patterns and anti-patterns, pointed out that you should be careful about chaining functions together because they're not like regular compute. But there are scenarios where you need to chain some processes together because maybe there's a workflow involved and there's any point in the workflow maybe you could start a process. The typical way of doing this is to have queue messages in between. You don't want to make an HTTP request from one function to another because HTTP is not durable and you could drop the message, which means you just drop the request, which is very bad. So typically, you use queues in between to make it durable. Now, there are libraries that raise the level of abstraction and make this pattern very easy to define. So in Azure, there's a feature called durable functions where you get to write code where it looks a lot like a method call. It's a little bit more verbose. 
uh, where you're calling an activity, behind the scenes, this library creates these queues for you and wires everything up for you. Because if you think about this, the queues don't really have anything to do with the problem you're trying to solve. Logically, you want one function to call another, and you have a whole workflow you need to process. So this library gives you a higher level of abstraction. So when I talk about levels of abstraction, it's not just about the service you're using. It's also the tooling that you're using on top of that, which gives you a more productive experience. So another example where durable functions are really valuable are if you have a fan out and fan in pattern, where you have one function that's kicking off a bunch of compute with different workers, and then you need to combine all these processes together. So as you can see here, the queues, again, are not important to the problem we're solving. And if you're using durable functions, you can express this very, very directly. So libraries raise the level of abstraction, making it so there's less for you to manage. So now I want to talk about tools. <laughs> because you need to actually deploy these applications. These pretty architectural diagrams are all great, but how do you get this actually working in production in a repeat repeatable way? So that if you take the same script and you run it in a different environment, it doesn't screw up your production environment. And you can always fix something if something goes wrong. So one option for deploying your application is to use a vendor deployment tool. So in AWS, that's CloudFormation, where you get to define your infrastructure in excruciating detail using YAML with mixed in embedded intrinsic functions which are just fantastic, let me tell you. Uh, and if you're on Azure, you don't even get to write YAML. You get to write gobs and gobs of JSON with no comments, because JSON doesn't support them. And if you're on Google, you get to write YAML, but you can customize it using Python, which is just great. Now, it's very powerful, but these are very low level. These feel like assembly language for the cloud. And the whole point of using these higher level managed services was to get away from the low level details. So this is where tooling comes in. So tooling also provides abstraction. There's a lot of tools available here. One popular one is Terraform for describing infrastructure. It's not as widely used in serverless, but it can be made to work. You can also use serverless framework, which has two facilities for this. You can use plugins or the new feature called components, where you group together common pieces of configuration. Or you can use Pulumi components, where you define how everything works using code. And I gave a talk at Velocity in San Jose a few weeks ago. If you're curious how each of these tools stack up, I have a GitHub repo here with examples written in each tool, so you can compare and contrast. So if you think about the situation we're in, we're, we want to we move towards more abstraction with serverless. And yet, this is the kind of experience that we have when we're authoring containers. There's a lot of goo here that has nothing to do with the problem we're trying to solve. Like building an image, getting it into a container registry, making sure everything points to it. And I think this image is why serverless folks are skeptical of containers. Because this is hard. And this is kind of not core to the experience of containers. So let's talk about how we might combine these using a tool that provides a higher level of abstraction. So let's go back to our video thumbnail example, because it's a very simple one, where we have a Lambda triggering a task in AWS Fargate. And let's look at how we might define this app in Pulumi, which gives you more abstraction. So first, let's talk about this task that's writing out to S3. So we need a Docker file. Thankfully, there is a pre-built Docker image for FFmpeg, and we just need to install two things, which are Python and the AWS CLI. And we'll just copy the video from S3 uh, into the container. We'll run FFmpeg on it, and then produce a thumbnail, which we copy back to S3. So this part is very simple. And when people get excited about Docker, I think they see examples like this, and they're like, oh, this is awesome. You can run this on your local machine, you have a great developer experience, and things seem very straightforward. The problem is getting this into production involves a lot of machinations. You have to build the image and put it into a registry, configure your tasks, and all that kind of stuff. And so that's the kind of thing that Pulumi makes easier. So 
the way that Pulumi works is that instead of writing all that YAML that we saw in cloud formation, or using a configuration language that's not code, but might look kind of like code, and there's a new thing that you have to learn, with Pulumi you get to just write code. So you want an S3 bucket, so you just say new cloud.bucket. Now, the one thing I want to point out is that this is not an SDK, Pulumi is not an SDK. You, this is just regular JavaScript code, but you don't run it the way you normally would. Instead, you run it through the Pulumi command line. And Pulumi knows what you've provisioned previously and what you're asking for now and compares the difference between the two. So if you were to run this twice and you hadn't changed anything, then there would be a no op. No, nothing will be created. The other thing is, note here I, I named it just bucket. One of the things Pulumi does by raising the level of abstraction is that it adds a unique name at the end. So you don't need to worry about you know, you need to call this bucket dev when it's in your dev account, you need to call it bucket prod when it's in a different account. These are one of those things that's handled for you. So this code creates a bucket, that's simple enough, but the meat of the task is wiring everything up. And that's where a lot of the complexity lies in cloud applications, where you need to think about how everything fits together rather than one individual piece of code. So I talked a lot about how it can be painful to get Docker containers in production. And in Pulumi, it's just code. And code gives you abstractions, like NPM packages, like I told you about earlier. So we found ourselves needing to do this often, where we have a Docker file that we need to build, we need to put it into a container registry, we need to provision a task using standard parameters, and that turns out to be hundreds of lines of Pulumi code, because there's so many resources to manage. You need to build the image, you need to configure ECS, you need to configure a bunch of IAM roles because it's Amazon and there's IAM roles like crazy. And as a developer though, what you're thinking about is I have this container image and I want to run this in Amazon. So you get to just write that code. Now let's say you don't like the way we're doing this. You want to customize this process in some way or another. You can do that by writing your own library. So what happens when you have code or a tool that gives you higher level abstractions is that you can make your own abstractions. So you can build on what cloud vendors provide for you. So this defines the, the ECS task, uh, excuse me, the Fargate task. Now we need, to, we need to wire everything together. And this is where Lambda comes in. Lambda is a great glue for multiple applications. You, whenever a new video is uploaded, we basically want an event that's on that bucket. And the one thing I want to point out here is I've been defining my infrastructure in JavaScript, and let's say I want to write my Lambda function in JavaScript. And this is a pretty small Lambda. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just put both of those into one piece of code that you're thinking about and managing? Now, if you want, you could put it in a separate file, but in this case, it's pretty straightforward to just put everything together. So we've defined that Lambda that's triggered whenever there's a new MP4 file uploaded to that S3 bucket. Now, we just invoke that FFmpeg task. And here, because it's all just code, you can just reference that variable that we defined above. You don't need to do some special thing. You don't need to use a special custom function that's defined in a DSL. You just use regular code. And now, we need to tell that Docker task what bucket to write to. And so, again, we just reference that bucket that we created earlier. Now, the point here I want you to notice is that when you're trying to understand this application and you're trying to understand what this Lambda does, you need to do more than just look at the implementation of the Lambda. You need to look at all the things that it's connecting to, all the things that it's composing together. So moving all of that closer into code means that it's easier to understand the application as a whole. Now, we'll have one more Lambda that's triggered whenever a JPEG file is available. And here we'd probably write to a database, but in this case, I'm just going to write a message to the console. So now, we've defined a full application, and it's fit all on one slide. And the reason that's possible is because the tool provided abstraction facilities, making it easier to understand the end-to-end -end application. And a lot of times in your code, you are doing the same thing over and over again, especially in infrastructure. You need to provision a queue, and this is how big it needs to be, and these are the parameters. And what people end up doing when they're using YAML is they copy and paste. And 
I just love that example because if you were doing a code review of someone's JavaScript code and they had copied and pasted something 10 times, you would not accept that code, right? But in YAML, we're like, of course that's what you're gonna do. There's no other option. You either copy and paste it 10 times or you write a Python script that generates cloud formation that has the same thing copied and pasted 10 times, which is terrible. You know, we're doing software engineering and it sucks that up until now, the way that you define your infrastructure is with no abstractions available. So one of our customers, for instance, needed to create queues that had common configuration. And most of the time, they needed a dead letter queue, but not always. And so I've elided this code. It was like about 10 lines of code of the queue configuration. But they just wrote a function. It was so natural. We didn't even have to tell them to do it. They're like, oh, I need this queue. And sometimes it's a dead letter that needs a dead letter queue, and sometimes not. So creating several queues is no harder than creating one queue because you have abstraction facilities at your disposal. So when you think about the cloud landscape and more abstraction, it comes to both the abstraction of the services you're using and how you're thinking about composing these together. And so when you use Pulumi to use containers, because there's a library with abstraction, there's a lot less you have to think about with containers. You only have to think about the things that are core to containers, like updating your Docker file and scaling out your app with the container orchestrator. You don't have to worry about building your container image and getting it into production. So to summarize, there's a place for serverless. There's a place for containers. There's a place for everything in the cloud. You just need to think about your problem and where it fits in. Use serverless if you have event-based code that needs to scale on demand. Use containers if you have a durable workload or you need to customize your software or hardware. And think about other opportunities to increase the level of abstraction of what you're doing. So you can use tooling for infrastructure as code. That means that you get to code at a higher level. If this is your first time learning about Pulumi, you can learn more at Pulumi.io and it's also open source on GitHub. Thank you.